Hello, we're going to continue our look at logical protection measures by going through a couple more. Starting with a basic one, essentially, right? Passwords. We all know what passwords are. We use passwords to enter our personal accounts. So passwords are there to only allow access to authorized users. Someone who's authorized has got permission. Now, for your email account, your school login, your YouTube account, only you should be authorized, only you should know that password. So in theory, only that person knows their password and so can log in. Well, that's why passwords are giving us security. They're logical security because they're on the computer. I've put in theory because we know some people might choose a weak password and have it guessed. Some people might write their password down and somebody else might know about it. Some people might share passwords. All of those are things which policies can help tighten up. But in an ideal world, passwords do give you that security. Now, you can, like I say, tighten up a few areas and improve aspects to do with passwords. One way to improve things is to obfuscate passwords. So when you are showing passwords on the screen, they should be obfuscated. That means essentially hiding what they are. And the most common way to do this is to show stars when you type in your password. So you can only tell the length of your password and not what is actually there. So obfuscation is hiding sensitive information. And it might be used in a few different areas, but I would say this is the most common being used to hide passwords. And for passwords specifically, this reduces the risk of shoulder surfing. So shoulder surfing is where somebody literally just looks behind over your shoulder most often and sees your password or your PIN number or your email address. They can pick up personal details just by looking at it. And so obfuscating the key information reduces that risk. A second big, big measure related to passwords is encryption. Now, the way encryption works is encryption uses a secret key, which is effectively a password, to scramble your data so it becomes unreadable. So it goes from, you know, some normal text into something which if you opened it, you would have no idea what this is. And you can't easily, you know, work out what this is in most cases because encryption uses quite often quite advanced maths, which it might take billions of years for you to break this code, right? It's very hard to break, unless you know the key. If you know the secret key, if you are an authorized user, you can easily descramble the message and understand it. Okay, so the key point is, encryption doesn't necessarily prevent you reading what's here. Like you can read what's here, it just makes no sense. And so you can't understand it even though you can see it. Okay, so it doesn't prevent you seeing it, it just means you might have to put in a password to be able to decrypt it and view it. So here is a picture from a PDF. You open the PDF, see that it's encrypted, you've got to put in the decryption key, which is the password, and it will unscramble it and you can see it. Okay, so often passwords are used as this secret key. And there are two types of encryption. One type of encryption is where you encrypt the data held on your storage. This is called encryption at rest. When you are at rest, the data is not moving, it's held on your hard drive, sat in your computer, it's not going anywhere, and so it's at rest. This is important so that if somebody did manage to log into the computer, they couldn't see the data unless they had that secret key. Or if the laptop was stolen or things like that, it just reduces that risk. Another important type of encryption is en encryption in transit. This is where data sent over networks is encrypted. And every time you see a padlock, for example, or you see HTTPS, that means you're using encryption in transit because data is moving from one computer to another and it is being scrambled so that nobody else who manages to intercept the message can understand it. So to give you an example, let's have two computers. One uh, is owned by Alice, one is owned by Bob. If Alice is sending a message to Bob, she might choose a secret key, which in reality will not be just a number, it'll be quite a long password or even a very, very long number. Uh, Bob will know the key as well. And so Alice can send her data in an encrypted version. So it's scrambled in some way. Here I've just added two to the numbers, but again, in reality, it uses very complicated maths, which can't be easily reversed. But because Bob knows the key, he's able to easily decrypt it and understand it. Now, the key message is encryption does not prevent somebody intercepting the data. So this evil person, Eve, could stumble upon the data being sent. 
Even if it was at rest, she could log on and see the file, but without that key, there is very little she can do because she doesn't understand it. Okay, so encryption doesn't prevent it being accessed, it just prevents you understanding it unless you've got that secret key.